So good evening and welcome. I'm Murray Levin, your host for the series on Orson Welles and the Golden Age of Hollywood. If you're like me, uh, maybe you're feeling a little bit bittersweet tonight. Sweet because a lot of us have been on a lovely journey over seven months where we've explored the life of an extraordinary great artist and American producer, director, writer, humanitarian, Orson Welles. So tonight, by way of conclusion, we're going to look at the legacy of Orson Welles. Orson Welles himself said, I think, something along the lines of, when I'm dead, they're going to love me. <laughs> to test Welles's punchline appraisal of his legacy, we're very, very fortunate to have with us one of the very best and one of the very best known film critics anywhere, and that's Bob Mandela. Uh, let me just say a word or two about Bob, although he really needs no introduction to this audience. He's really almost synonymous with NPR, National P Public Radio, and believe it or not, you can see a very youthful fellow who will shortly be at this mic, but he is approaching his 40th anniversary with NPR, which is a, uh, a great accomplishment. And in a strange way, his career was, you might say, almost uh, bookended by Orson Welles. Not that that's been a long, long, deep feature of his career, but as a young critic and staffer at NPR on short notice, he was asked to and acquitted himself very well in putting together an appreciation and an obituary of L. Wells, who died in 1985. And in more recent years, uh, Bob Mandela is the author of a famous April Fool's prank, which I just ask you to look out for. You may see it. You may hear about it during the course of the evening. I don't know. Uh, so anyway, uh, right before I bring Bob to the microphone, I do want to remind you that you play an important role in all of our meetings, and I want you to... Um, Think of your questions, and I'll, we'll have a Q&A at the conclusion of Bob Mandela's remarks. And as always, please wait until one of our uh, intrepid volunteers brings the mic to you. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Bob Mandela, the legacy of Orson Welles. Hello. I, um, I was thinking about doing this speech, and I started looking at the other people who were doing it. And I think I am probably, that I've written the least of anybody who's been in this series about Orson Welles. Uh, I asked the NPR librarians to look back and to, at the transcripts and see how many times I'd mentioned him. And they found a few dozen mentions but only two pieces um, that I'd actually done about Wells. And the first of them is the one that we were just talking about. Um, it was on October 10, 1985, um, which is 38 years ago last week. Um, and it was just months after I had started freelancing for NPR, so I was not an experienced person there. I got a call at about 2.20 in the afternoon, and the reason I remember that, well, you'll hear as I go, at 2.20 in the afternoon from a producer at All Things Considered who said, Orson Welles has just died. Would you be willing to do an obit on him? And I thought, yes. I mean, this is fantastic. I'm a freelancer. I, I can't believe you're asking me to do this. Um, and he starts talking about what they've got. They have a clip from War of the Worlds, and they have a clip from... Uh, 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 what's, the, what's the name of his picture? Uh, Citizen Kane. And um, so they're, they're prepped for that. Um, and he said, we'll give you the last shot in the, uh, slot in the show so you have time to write. And it was at that moment that I realized he means tonight. It, th this is 2.20 in the afternoon. The show goes on the air at 5. 
right? It was like, ah. So I, I, it was gonna take me 30 minutes to drive down to, uh, to NPR. I got in my car, I went as fast as I could, um, and thinking all the way, what do I know about Orson Welles? Because this is in the days before the internet. Um, 1985, it wasn't, wasn't even a dream in Al Gore's eyes. Um, so anyway, I, didn't, I, I had to think, what do I know? And it's also a time when the librarians are going to give you a, she a thick sheaf of paper. And that paper is going to be newspaper clippings and all kinds of things that are really hard to digest quickly. And I had very little time to do it. So I, um, I dashed down to uh, NPR. I'm looking through their stuff at about 5.15. I was finally ready for, for an edit. And this is also the other thing about it. You're, you gotta, the, there aren't computers. I'm basically cutting and paping, uh, t uh, taping pieces of, of paper together um, so that we, we end up with a, an assemblage that I can sort of read. Um, so anyway, I go to, go to the edit, and I'm sitting there in the newsroom editing, and I can hear the show on the loudspeakers in the room. And... Um, we finish the edit, we go into the, into the, uh, the studio, and my voice is getting tight and higher, because I'm scared, and I'm gonna have this piece on very shortly, and it's, it's just terrifying. And we get to the, I, I, I'm, I'm stumbling all over myself. I, I am really doing a bad read, because I'm so nervous. And we get to the part where the Citizen Kane clip is supposed to go. And I watch a guy run out of the studio with two reels of tape. Have you all seen broadcast news? You remember when she's running with the tape, you know, that she has to get on the air? He's running out with these two reels of tape, and I keep going, and my voice is still tight, and it's, I'm barely getting through it. And I finally finish, and somebody else runs out with two reels of tape. And the engineer comes over the headset and says, thank you. And I get up, and I go out into the main newsroom, and I hear my voice on the air. The first half of the piece is already airing. The second half, this guy has run out with on two reels of tape. And I just about had a heart attack. Well, anyway, here's what I came up with. <laughs> there, there was a short delay. <laughs> it radio and film. Orson Welles was a recognizable presence, both by his booming voice and by his large size. He was six feet two inches tall, and at one point he weighed more than 300 pounds. Critic Bob Mondello reviews the life of the man whose career peaked early. He was the man who panicked America, the man who made Hollywood grow up. He was an egotist, a tyrant, and a genius. And like so many of the artists to whom we attach that last word, Orson Welles achieved much in his early years. He played the violin for Stravinsky and Ravel at age seven, performed in Shakespeare at the age of 10. And even as a youth, his ego was legendary. Nearly everyone who met him was impressed with him, but none were as impressed with his talent as Welles himself. His formal schooling ended when he was 15, but by that time, he was an accomplished painter, musician, and actor. Claiming to be a famous American actor, he conned his way onto the Irish stage at age 16. But it was on his return to America that his career blossomed. At 22, with John Houseman, he founded the Mercury Theater in New York, producing, directing, and starring in productions that rocked the theater establishment. A fascist Julius Caesar, an all-black so-called voodoo Macbeth, the Mark Blitzstein opera The Cradle Will Rock, but that scarcely kept him occupied. At the same time, he was doing 12 to 15 weekly radio shows. And at 23, he panicked America with the radio broadcast of War of the Worlds. Listeners really believed the nation was being invaded by Martians. Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radio... But Wells needed new worlds to conquer. Three years later, the boy wonder made his Hollywood directing debut. At the age of 26, he unveiled what is certainly his masterwork, producing, directing, and starring in Citizen Kane. I don't even know what you're 
why you have to go straight out to the newspaper. You never should have married a newspaper man. They're worse than sailors. I absolutely adore you. Oh, Charles, even newspaper men have to sleep. I'll call Mr. Bernstein, have him put off my appointments until noon. Citizen Kane changed the way we saw a film. Its flashbacks, quick cuts, even the camera angles were revolutionary. Audiences were used to filmmaking that was very much like theater, linear plots told in linear ways. Wells established that the public was more sophisticated than that, and he wrote the book on film grammar. He invented the fast-paced editing effects that are now used and abused so frequently they've become a cliché. Miami Vice couldn't exist without him. But oddly, while his techniques were adopted by the industry, Wells was cast aside. When he resisted the efforts of insensitive Hollywood studios to re-edit his films during the 40s and 50s to make them more conventional, he was labeled a troublemaker. And that reputation for dissent stuck with him through the rest of his career. He fled to Europe, where he hired out as an actor in other people's projects to finance his own movies. But the last 25 years of his life were marked by a series of aborted or unfinished projects. He did wine commercials and dreamed of filming Shakespeare's gargantuan epic, King Lear. In many ways, it was his own story, rejected by those he'd nurtured, railing against the elements, held back by his own stubbornness and resistance to compromise. A huge man in every sense of the word, but hugely vulnerable too, and irreplaceable. Orson Welles died today at the age of 70. I'm Bob Mandela. Mr. Bernstein is apt to pay a visit to the ministry now and then. Does he have to? <laughs> now, could you hear... Could you hear how high and tight my voice got? Oh my God, I was terrified. <sighs> so anyway, I'm done here, right? I've done his, the legacy of Orson Welles. Um, that was what I managed to do with two hours of prep and not very much research, but let's start there because that's what most people knew in 1985 about Orson Welles. What I knew, I had learned in college um, and at DC repertory houses. I used to, you know, the kind that used to have uh, double features of everything. Um, and then after college, um, before I was a critic, I worked as a publicist for a chain of movie theaters in the Washington area. It was a suburban chain. Uh, they had 32 houses in 17 locations. So they were mostly single theaters and twins, right? And um, in all the time I was there, not one of them played an Orson Welles movie. Not even once. And uh, when I started there, the last film he'd released was seven years earlier, Chimes at Midnight. Um, since then, he'd announced two films, The Deep and Treasure Island, but he never finished The Deep, and he released Treasure Island as a short. The year that I started, 1972, Citizen Kane was named the best film in the world um, for the second time by the uh, Sight and Sound Critics Poll. That's the group that, that uh, basically hundreds of critics, and they, they get a consensus choice. And it stayed there for 40 years, and that didn't mean we played it. Um, in the more than a decade that I was a movie publicist, Wells created exactly, or finished, one film, F for Fake, um, he was in a few. He was in the Muppet movie. Um, he was the narrator for History of the World Part One from Mel Brooks. Um, but what I'm saying is that uh, for the last two decades of his career, basically, Wells was almost entirely absent from the big screen. The Spielbergs and the Scorseses and the Lucases um, had taken over and the Coppolas, um, but they weren't hiring him. He was not part of the cinematic discussion, and except as a historical figure. And that's how I knew him when I wrote that obit. We now have had the advantage of many years and a whole bunch of books about him, uh, lots of scholarly work. Uh, you've heard from a number of people who have written about him, um, a dozen or so biographies, including a stunning one called Rosebud. I advise you to, to read it. It's, it's amazing by David Thompson and a deliciously readable one. It's just got all these grim anecdotes um, called uh, Citizen Wells by Frank Ray Brady. Um, so we, anyway, we know enough about him now to unpack his career a little. Um, he was, as I said in that, uh, 15 when he convinced his guardian to uh, let him quit school uh, and travel unsupervised to Ireland to pursue painting. And I could talk about that, but uh, happily, many years later, he described it himself in his 90s, 1973 film, F for Fake. Um, 
it's a sort of a mockumentary uh, that combines several of his enthusiasms. Uh, magic, he does a lot of tricks in it. Howard Hughes, who was originally going to be what Citizen Kane was all about, um, explored through writer Clifford Irving, who wrote a fake uh, biography or autobiography of him. Uh, art, through the art forger uh, Elmir, who painted Picasso's on camera for Wells. And um, his biggest enthusiasm himself, through the tale of his own start. Double-click again. You've been freely owning up to your own past. I better do some confessing myself. Francois was an art dealer. And I, well, I was an artist. I thought I was anyway. Like Elmir, I too was once a hungry painter. But not here in France. No, I was hungry in Ireland. I'd come there to paint, bought a donkey and cart, filled the cart with paints and canvases, and went traveling. At night, I slept under the cart. It was a very nice summer. But then when I got to Dublin, the donkey had to go up for auction, and so did I. My paintings were gone, all given away to the Irish farmers who'd given me food. I'd run out of paint and money. I was 16 years old, and my career, as you might say, was at the crossroads. Winter was coming in. Oh, I guess I could have found myself an honest job as a dishwasher or something, but no, I took the easy way. I went on the stage. I'd never been on the stage, but I told them in Dublin I was a famous star from New York and somehow got them to believe me. And that's how I started. Began at the top and have been working my way down ever since. If acting is an art, cooking up that bogus Broadway career was a fine case of art forgery. And then later on the radio, well, we've seen how Elmir started. In my past, there aren't any Picassos. No, my next flight into fakery was by flying saucer. Obviously, he's referring there to War of the Worlds, which brought him to Hollywood's attention at the advanced age of 23. Um, he had, by that time, started the Mercury Theater with John Houseman, created a sensation with Shakespeare, uh, with uh, an all-black uh, voodoo Macbeth and a fascist Julius Caesar that had touches of Mussolini to it. He created another sensation with the Cradle Will Rock, which when he was kicked out of the theater and was not allowed to perform there, um, he marched the theater, uh, marched the audience 10 blocks away to another theater that they rented, where Mark Blitzstein, the composer, was going to play the music and do all the parts on stage because the actors still weren't allowed to go on stage. And they were, the actors went up with the audience and they were sitting in the audience and at one point, one of them stood up and started doing her part, and then the others started doing their parts, and Blitzstein found himself basically doing a production without the production, right? Um, it, it was so successful, it was, it was electrifying, and it was so successful that it's basically how you do that show now. Um, a lot of people have said that Wells learned from that, that you don't necessarily do all the big stuff that you think you need to do for a theatrical production. Sometimes it's a good idea to let the audience imagine, which of course he had already been doing on the radio. Um, let me see, I've, I've leaped ahead of myself. Um, now he did all of that while he was producing and starring in radio programs. His schedule got so busy um, that cabs couldn't get him from one theater to the next in time, so he discovered that you don't have to be sick to hire an ambulance. And so he had, uh, he, he got ambulances to race him to these places with their sirens uh, running. Um, it, <laughs> I think you have to be 20 to carry that sort of thing off. <laughs> um, Finally, RKO uh, hired him out in Hollywood to a three-film contract, and he headed for Hollywood to write, direct, star in, and produce movies. He spent a year futzing around with what sounds like an absolutely terrible idea for the Heart of Darkness, um, where he, was, uh, he had the idea that the camera would be the main character. Um, it sounds like a bad streaming notion, basically. Um, and he gave that up and he came up with Citizen Kane. 
a story with, an, with obvious parallels to newspaper titan uh, William Randolph Hearst, now once he had given up the idea of doing it about, uh, uh, what did I just say? Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes. Um, and so he made an enemy of the most powerful man in publishing at 26. Um, many years later, Dick Cavett asked Wells about his arrival in Hollywood, and Wells made it sound like it was no big deal. I, I, I've always wanted to know the answer to this. The, the, you always hear that when you were 26 years old and you made Citizen Kane, uh, and they said, you can't do th these things, you can't have the background in focus or whatever it was, or you can't shoot a scene that way, Mr. Wells, or young Mr. Wells, or Orson, or whatever they called you then. And you knew that you could, and how did you know this? Uh, because I didn't know any better, and it's very much in the line with what Jack was saying earlier in the show. Jack Lemon. comes from, from just, uh, you know, sheer dumbness. You, you're sure it's got to be your good and your great. It's ignorance. There's no authority in the world like it. But, but there's, there's, there's got to be something more than that technically. I mean, how did you know that... You know you... technically that the whole bag of movies can be learned in about a day and a half. Okay. I kid you not. Now, how, how does it work? How do you do it? You get a guy who knows and, how to... And ask him, and that's the end of it. It isn't yeah. much harder than taking a, a, a home movies. It's just about three points harder. Mm -hmm. And all these guys who do it try to make a big mystery of it because that's the, their living. Mm -hmm. And I have the right to say it because I had in my first picture in Kane the greatest cameraman who ever lived, who was Greg Toland. And he came to my office and said, I want to work in your picture. My name is Toland. And I said, why do you, Mr. Toland? He said, because you've never made a picture. <laughs> and you don't know what cannot be done. Now, that is a very nice story. And it, it fits his legend. He was brash and bold and so young. And for everyone else, can you imagine being a working uh, director in Hollywood and having him come along? And your producer is saying, look what he's doing, right? I mean, he's amazing. When I was about 12, there was a uh, cartoon in The New Yorker that I thought was hilarious. It was a father looking at a kid who was about my age, and the kid is thumbing through the encyclopedia. And the kid is saying, I'm looking to see what Abraham Lincoln had done by the time he was your age. Now, I like that as a representative whatever. Um, now, having read a bunch of Wells books, I have noticed something. If you are writing a biography of Orson Wells, somewhere around page 350, let's say, let's say your book is 600 pages, somewhere around page 350, you are finally done with Citizen Kane. That's his first movie, and you have 14 more completed movies, quite a few uncompleted movies, a whole second career in theater, a third career as an actor for hire, a fourth career in television, a fourth and a half career in magic, a, Rita, a marriage to Rita Hayworth, for heaven's sakes, plus all those ads for bad California wines. Um, and all of that get less, gets less than half of the book. Which is not to say that a lot of what he did wasn't worthy. It was just seriously compromised, like his marriage. Um, the Magnificent Ambersons, which was butchered by the studio and given a happy ending, and its original negatives were destroyed. It's all true. His Latin American documentary that was made at the request of the US government and then canceled by his studio. The Stranger in 1945, his only major box office success. He did it to prove he could come in on time and under budget, and he did, but he'd agreed to a terrible contract that let the studio make cuts um, to, the, to the script both in advance and then to the final film. To circumvent that, he shot as much as, of it as he could in long, continuous takes with nothing for them to cut back to. Um, and he also put a film within a film, uh, which was already becoming a sort of a Wells trademark, and it used the, um, the very first Holocaust footage in any Hollywood feature. So you can call that one a success on points, kind of, uh, and on the studio's terms. Then he made Lady from Shanghai, another film noir. It was butchered by the studio. They demanded reshoots, so his no close-ups, no edits trick didn't work a second time. Um, the studio's changes cut a full hour from what he had made uh, and put the film over budget. There is a Hall of Mirrors bit in it that is magnificent. 
and three minutes. It was designed to be 20 minutes. Um, just imagine what we lost with that. I mean, just not having that footage. Um, critics at the time mostly found uh, Lady from Shanghai confusing. Posterity has been much kinder to it. After that, he made Macbeth. Macbeth was, in 1948, only the fourth time that Hollywood had made a Shakespeare film uh, since the silent era. Uh, he added a character. He beefed up the witches. Uh, he used bits of his stage voodoo Macbeth. The studio gave him $700,000 if he agreed to pay for anything over that. So he completed it in 23 days with uh, rented costumes and on sets that um, were actually designed for Roy Rogers. Um, but it's the Scottish play. It was famously cursed. Um, and the curse on this one was he had everybody do it with Scottish burrs, right? Lots of rolling of R's and things like that, making them all but unintelligible. Um, and worse, he recorded all the dialogue first and then had them act to the dialogue. In other words, they were essentially lip syncing their parts, which is, of, of course, is great for acting. <laughs> Here's a clip. This is of him, and he, of course, does it better than anyone. Uh, you've gotten ahead. Uh, sorry, I it's supposed to be a clip. Yes. Just before that. Whoa, there's nothing there. Let's not play that clip. We're not going to play that clip. All right, the next one. Uh, it, it, it is basically him railing at the elements, um, and it's a lovely clip of him acting, but you can tell he's lip syncing. Um, okay, Othello. Uh, he uh, makes up for Macbeth's 23 day shoot by taking three years to complete this one. Um, the first day of shooting, the producer went bankrupt. Uh, Wells put all of his, a lot of his own money into it, but kept running out of cash and stopping for months to take acting gigs in things like The Third Man to get cash to start up again. This prompted some workarounds. Rodrigo's murder uh, took, takes place in a Turkish bath. Why? Because the uh, costumes had been impounded and he couldn't get them out and towels he could get. So um, anyway, that worked. Uh, it has some uh, nice Wellesian trademarks, uh, odd camera angles and uh, reorders scenes and starts with funerals of the main characters, uh, Othello and Desdem Desdemona, which is remarkably like uh, uh, Citizen Kane. After that, Mr. Arcaden, uh, another noir. Um, Sorry, I think this is the clip. Oh, we can play it, okay. Or shall they speak? For oh, now I am bent to know by the worst means. The worst. Oh no! You secret flash! And midnight hates! I conjure you by that which you profess! How here you come to know it! Answer me! Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches! Though yesterday waves confound and swallow navigation up, though greedy corn be lodged and trees blown down, though castles topple on their water's heads, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, though the treasures of nature's Germans tumble all together, even till destruction shaken. Answer me! Quite something, right? Um, okay, we're, we're a couple of movies past that now. Mr. Arcaden, uh, another noir. Uh, Wells missed an editing deadline, and the producer took back the film. They took it away from him. Um, they released five different versions of it. Uh, Wells called it his biggest disaster, but he married its leading lady, so a personal loss. Um, a personal gain, rather. Uh, a Touch of Evil, 1958, arguably his best noir. Uh, Charlton Heston had him hired to direct, but he immediately started clashing with the producers. He went to New York to do a TV show when he was supposed to be editing. They locked him out of the edit booth and recut it more conventionally, and he then spent, I mean, this is a, this is a case of, you know what, it, it's so much easier to do it right the first time than it is to make up for it. He wrote a 50, how many words? 
58-page memo arguing for why his original version was better and why they should restore it. And they ultimately did uh, in 1998, uh, 13 years after his death and 40 years after the movie. Um, the trial in 1962, um, this is Kafka. Producers ran out of money, uh, so he couldn't build sets. Uh, the Gare d'Arcy in, uh, in Paris was a big hulking behemoth that was empty at the time, so he made it there. Um, Wells thought Kafka was hilarious. Um, nobody else did, and the film flopped. But again, he met Oja Kodar, um, his partner for the rest of his life, uh, so a personal win. Chimes at Midnight, uh, kind of brilliant, um, based on Wells' theater project Five Kings. Uh, maybe the best acting he ever did, um, virtually unseen in this country. Um, he was playing Falstaff in it. Uh, there's a story that Wells was left speechless a few years later uh, when Charlton Heston, who was always a big fan of Wells, uh, asked him to play Falstaff uh, in a movie he was making, saying that it was a part he'd always wanted to see him in. Ouch. Um, then F for Fake. Uh, he didn't shoot most of it. He added footage to an existing documentary. It was an amusing little trifle that ended up being the last film he completed. And then Don Quixote, never finished tilting at windmills in his own lifetime, uh, spent so long shooting it that his star died and it was released <laughs> posthumously. The Other Side of, Mid uh, sorry, the, other side of the Wind um, spent six years on the story of an aging director who is desperately looking for funds to complete his final film. Those funds in real life came from Iranian backers. So when the Shah of Iran was deposed, the film fell into a sort of a legal limbo uh, from which it emerged in 2018, 35 years after his death. Uh, that one was also released posthumously. So as I say, compromised. Now there is some beauty there in the films he made, but it, if it never reaches an audience, it's hard to argue that it burnishes his reputation. Uh, so how do you measure the legacy of a guy who has done those things, who's captured the imagination of a generation in radio by panicking it, in theater by politicizing classics, in film by taking on a titan of publishing and making a masterpiece, all by the age of 26, but who then spent four decades squandering the opportunities, one after another, making a handful of inter interesting films and lots that were less interesting, acting in certifiable junk to pay for projects that he cared about and then not actually making those projects. And yet he was universally regarded as a genius, an innovator, the creator of the greatest film ever made. It strikes me that there are several ways to evaluate the legacy of that sort of a person. Um, in Latin, the phrase is ars longa vita brevis. Art is lasting, life is short. So what lasts in art? Um, well, with theater, what lasts is mostly audience memories. So in theory, he's gone within 30 or 40 years. Um, but also things that get mimicked, get, get copied and adapted. So Brando mumbles in a movie and all of a sudden acting doesn't have to be grand gestures, right? Wells does Julius Caesar in modern dress and makes it about fascism and now classics don't have to feel classical. When I was researching this talk, um, I looked at a lot of reviews from back then just to look at what people were saying about his work. The ones for Julius Caesar and Voodoo Macbeth seemed odd. Um, like they weren't sure how to talk about the productions. Now remember, this is the 1930s. Um, George and Ira Gershwin are doing musicals. Uh, all modern plays look like Ibsen, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a, a dining room set or a, a living room set. Um, producer David Belasco was famous at that point because he would buy a house and tear most of it down and bring the rest of it to the stage and re-erect it on stage. So he was really literally putting everything, including the kitchen sink on stage. Um, stages all had curtains. They were, there were no thrusts. There were no uh, uh, theaters in the round back then. And the way that critics talked about Julius Caesar, it was clearly unusual. So just on a hunch, I tried to find examples of Shakespeare done in modern dress, going back to like 
a century earlier, to 1830, and I found one. It was in Birmingham about 13 years beforehand, and it was a production of Coriolanus, and the critics were puzzled, and the audiences hated it. So imagine, along comes Wells in the same season that Antony and Cleopatra is being produced in togas on Broadway. Actually, there, um, this prompted my favorite theatrical review quote. Um, I'm pretty sure it was John Mason Brown who said, Tallulah Bankhead barged down the Nile last night <laughs> in Cleopatra, or as Cleopatra, and sank. <laughs> Wish I'd written that. Um, anyway, that's how Shakespeare was done back then. Uh, lots of velvet period trappings. And Wells does Julius Caesar in modern dress after rewriting bits of it, um, arguing that Shakespeare wrote it to sound normal for Elizabethan audiences, meaning sort of London colloquial in 1600. Um, he wanted it to sound that way for contemporary audiences, so he incorporated modern language um, and language from other plays, including, and I'm, I'm not saying that I have discovered the source of this, but including a lot from Coriolanus, that it, it is script incorporated, a whole bunch of that, and no togas. The idea was to be urgent and contemporary, and he does it for a reason. He does it with fascism brutalizing Europe to make a political point in a way that is clear politically, a way that the audience gets, that critics get, and it not only clicks, it becomes influential. Just a few years later, Olivier films Henry V, not just as the story of a king, but as a call to arms for World War II Britain. Now, it's not in modern dress, but it, it is clearly politicized. It's designed to talk to today. Um, to, uh, to, well, not to today, today, to that, to his day, um, a wartime English uh, public, and he wins Oscars with it. These days on stage, it's rare to see Shakespeare done in doublets and hose. Uh, people don't do it anymore, um, pretty much ever, including Julius Caesar. If you think back six years to that Shakespeare in the Park production um, that made headlines the summer after Trump took office, um, Caesar had red hair, uh, a blue suit and a red tie. His wife had a Scandinavian accent and a Melania-inspired uh, wardrobe. His son Octavius was a nerdy Jared Kushner type in a bulletproof vest. Um, they even added a line. One of Shakespeare, uh, one of uh, Caesar's annoyed opponents, uh, said his, that his supporters would have forgiven him even if Caesar had stabbed their mothers on Fifth Avenue. And the audience howled, and they kept howling right up until the assassination which was met with stony, horrified silence, which is kind of brilliant. And it is the same trick, exactly what Wells had done 80 years earlier. And in between, uh, Eastern European directors toward the end of the Cold War, looking for ways to get around censorship, were forever reinventing classics in modern contexts to comment on society. Um, Richard III as the story of tyranny in, uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, Kafka's The Trial as a tale of socialist bureaucracy run amok. In this country in the 1960s, non-traditional casting of the same sort that uh, Wells had used in Voodoo Macbeth made inroads in Shakespeare in classical theater way before it made inroads in um, Tennessee Williams or Neil Simon. Um, directors discovered that if you break the mold the way that Wells did, the possibility, possibilities become endless. So that's theater. In film, what lasts is the actual film, the work itself. Theoretically forever, assuming that we can digitize it and, uh, and color correct it and all those kinds of things. But the copying and adapting part also applies. Uh, directors mimic what they like. They try out variations on what they like. And when they see new techniques, they adopt them. So let's assume that Citizen Kane is a masterpiece that rewrote Hollywood's rule books, and then look at what happened right after Citizen Kane. Hollywood storytelling, previously dead linear. You tell a story, and it starts at the beginning, and it goes to the end, and it's just straight ahead, um, can suddenly accommodate multiple points of view and moral complexity. I mean, think uh, Kurosawa's Rashomon or Tarantino's pub, Pulp Fiction. Um, stories can be structurally tricky. Um, Wells starts Cain with Cain's death and then tells the, whole, the film's whole story in that news reel right at the very beginning. 
Um, he is basically there adapting uh, uh, the, uh, the Greek theater's chorus, right? Who the, the, the chorus would come out and tell you what you were going to see and then you'd see it, right? And so he's basically doing that. Um, but it's new to film, although it's old in world theater. And he mixes up the order of events, a device that was later used in Lawrence of Arabia uh, by David Lean and Reds by Warren Beatty and um, Malcolm X by Spike Lee and Social Network by David Fincher. Um, tragic anti-heroes can now be sympathetic uh, from The Godfather to Mad Max to The Joker. Um, dramatic lighting and deep focus and odd angles are all just basic you know, part of part of the filmmaking now. I mean, they're they're just what we do. Um, inconclusive endings are okay, which was unheard of before Kane. Um, now, kind of standard, uh, but not in Wells films because the studios kept taking back his films and re-editing them to give them conclusive endings because that's what they knew how to do. Um, and a filmmaker today can ignore studio casting pretty much, uh, especially the independent filmmakers and work with a repertory company of his own choosing or her own choosing. Um, Wells was asked about doing that once and gave a very flip answer. An impertinent question. I wanted to ask you, if you have ever cast a friend instead of the right person for the part? Frequently. Have you regretted it? Frequently. <laughs> Would you do it again? Yes. <laughs> Do you think because I don't regard art as of prime importance. I already told you I prefer every other loyalty in life to art. I hate the romantic conception of art as taking precedence over anything. I think it's the last thing to be considered, always. Certainly would regard friendship as more important than my art. So, um, Wells also arguably helped invent the mockumentary uh, on radio in War of the Worlds, uh, in the fake news rule in Citizen Kane, in F for Fake. All those things make him an innovator, an experimenter, a maverick, but not one of those things would seem remarkable if you asked a college student looking at the film today. Because the thing is, the thing, of, the thing about experimenting is that if it clicks, and is influential, then when you look back at it later, it doesn't seem like anything much. And the example I always use to describe this is Cabaret uh, on stage. Joel Gray played the, uh, played the MC. Uh, it had songs commenting on society rather than commenting on, uh, on love. Uh, it had a huge mirror that was angled to reflect the audience um, and thereby implicating us in Nazi horrors. In an age of Hello, Dolly! and Funny Girl, that was shocking. 20 years later, um, Hal Prince stayed, restaged the show with Joel Gray again as the MC. Um, and it felt incredibly old-fashioned. Um, because other shows had mimicked those things. And now, the only thing you saw when you watched it were all the plot scenes that, and the plot songs that um, uh, Bob Fosse had cut out of the movie, right? So it, what you saw was this lumbering thing with a clever idea in it. People had taken the idea and run. So I think that's what happens. And, and actually, while I'm talking theater here, um, let me shift. Um, a few years after Wells died, I think it was about six or seven years, I saw a production of Moby Dick rehearsed. Um, that's a show he created in London in 1955. He'd done Moby Dick on radio and he wanted to do it on screen, but doing it on stage, I mean, come on, you gotta have a whale, right? Um, his solution was you play with form. Uh, now, I saw the show in the 1990s at a small regional stage. Um, theater had changed a lot since My Fair Lady was big, um, so I had to sort of put myself back in the mood of that. Um, Audiences back then were used to a very conventional sort of theater, and th this was the early days of Beckett and Ionesco, right? But almost everything else was really ordinary. But this show starts as an acting troupe is assembling on an empty stage in street clothes, and they're there to do Shakespeare's King Lear. And of course, that was long a Wells dream, right? They've got props for Lear, and the ones that this little theater company had were tombstones for a graveyard, and a big piece of sheet metal that if you rattle it, it sounds like thunder, 
right? So they have a thunder sheet. And they start the first scene of King Lear, and this is without Lear because he's late, which is to say he's the Orson Welles part. Um, and then just as they get going, Lear shows up, and he's had a different idea. He doesn't want to do King Lear, he wants to do Moby Dick. And he hands out scripts to a few major players, and the rest of them are all supposed to improvise. Um, so they start. Um, Lear's fool is now Queequeg. Uh, good guy Edgar in Lear is now Starbuck. Lear is Ahab, okay? So now Wells doesn't need a whale. It's, uh, his staging is a rehearsal, so it'll all be suggested, much the way things were in radio. Um, the magic will be in you know, firing the imagination. Um, I remember one effect in there. He needed, he needed the whale to rear up over the ship, and I remember the, the actor playing the Wells part um, went up to another actor and had him hold a, a spotlight down where you would hold a, a point of view camera if you were trying to do a weird angle shot from below. And so he held the spotlight down really low and then Wells took this curved uh, uh, cardboard gra gravestone that they were gonna use in Lear and held it in front of the light which cast a huge shadow on the stage and also on the audience. He'd created a whale. <laughs> It was amazing. It was so effective. Um, so anyway, uh, just for the, for the record, it's there in the script, I asked. I asked him, and it's there in the script that he wrote in 1955. So it, it's, it was amazing. Um, so another way to look at a legacy is who got inspired by the person. There are folks he trained Citizens Kane was one of the first times that a youngster named uh, Robert Wise had ever worked in a, a movie. He went on to direct The Day the Earth Stood Still and West Side Story and The Sound of Music, so it was, you know, it was a good start. Um, there are folks who followed him and have done similar things. Uh, Quentin Tarantino uh, had an equally explosive arrival, certainly, with his first movie, although he did it at the advanced age of 30. Um, John Singleton was 24 when he got nominated for an Oscar for Boys in the Hood, and he's now become a writer, director, star. Elia Kazan jumped from stage to screen in the same way that, um, that Wells did, with, first with Streetcar Named Desire, then with On the Waterfront. Um, Bob Fosse made that jump with, uh, with Cabaret, and he'd already made it as an actor at that point. Among the other filmmakers uh, who use Wellesian devices and cite, cite him as an influence, John Huston uh, used his camera techniques in Maltese Falcon and Asphalt Dungle. David Lean adopted his narrative approach in Lawrence of Arabia. William Friedkin, who just died recently, uh, strenuously defended Wells when Pauline Kael claimed that Wells was not the auteur of Citizen Kane. Um, uh, Friedkin said he'd seen Citizen Kane at least 100 times. Um, and that it was a huge influence when he made The Exorcist. Um, like Wells, Friedkin had a really booming start with The Exorcist and uh, French Connection and a few other films, and then spent years wandering in the cinematic wilderness. Um, Martin Scorsese developed a rep company and adopted uh, Wellesian character ideas in Raging Bull and The Irishman and most recently in Killers of the Flower Moon, which opens Friday, I think. Um, and is, it, it actually has a, uh, a silent film uh, uh, newsreel at the very beginning of it. And I, 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 the, the, the problem when you're doing a piece about Orson Welles, is, or a speech about Orson Welles, is that you see him everywhere. It's amazing. Um, Francis Ford Coppola, his Apocalypse Now is essentially the film Welles would love to have made of Heart of Darkness and also Stanley Kubrick and Ridley Scott and Paul Thomas Anderson and Christopher Guest and a host of others cite him as an influence and inspiration. And then there are the folks who seem to be following in his footsteps a little more closely. Um, Kenneth Branagh is often compared to Laurence Olivier, which makes sense, they're both Brits, right? Um, but Wells is, I think, a better fit. Uh, Branagh made Henry V at 29 and behaved in a very Wellesian way. Um, he brought his rep company with him. He had a rep repertory company called the Renaissance Company, not unlike Wells's Mercury Company. 
Um, I think you can say that Derek Jacobi is his Joseph Cotton, that Judy Dench is his Agnes Moorhead, um, in almost a dozen films, so it's not like he, he abandoned them later. Branagh filmed lots of Shakespeare and always starred himself in it, just like Wells. He mixed it up with film noir. The, the first film he made after um, uh, Henry V was Dead Again, which is a noir, um, and that goes all the way up to, what, four weeks ago with Haunting in Venice? Um, and he made self he made self-referential movies on occasion. Uh, Belfast is his, in which he's basically telling his own story in much the same way that uh, in parts of F for Fake, uh, Wells was doing that. But he's a studio uh, workhorse, right? He's not a maverick. Um, he, he makes, he, he's been very successful in Hollywood. Um, Joel and Ethan Cohen were 29 and 26 when they made their first film noir, uh, Blood Simple. They have definitely reinvented film style since then. Um, Joel recently made a black and white Macbeth with Denzel Washington, uh, where Wells's influence is, is just undeniable, from camera angles to, uh, to sets. Um, just so you can see, I brought a, a, the witches scene. Uh, Wells had done it with bubbling cauldrons. Cohen made it all about birds perching in branches, and hence the camera angles. And we can't hear it. But you can see it. I don't know why we can hear it. Do you? There it is. trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Finger of birth strangled babe. Ditch delivered by a drab. Liver of blaspheming Jew, gall of goat, and slips of you, silvered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk and Tartar slips. Here's the blood of a bat. Put in that. Put in that. Round about call and go, in the hoist entrail throw, for a charm of powerful trouble. Like a bad broth, boil and bubble. You can almost see Wells doing that, can't you? Um, so, there are lots of other Wells touches in that movie. Uh, when the king gets to Macbeth's castle, I actually thought for a moment that they were shooting in the same room. Um, it's uh, the same courtyard. The, the sets, the angularity, the lighting are all very Wells. Um, another director, Wes Anderson, he has said the Royal Tenenbaums is a deliberate comic riff on the Magnificent Ambersons. Royal, Magnificent, okay? He chose the house he set it in because it was a dead ringer for the Ambersons house. He's talked about his love for Wells, especially Ambersons and the trial. His latest comedy, Asteroid City, made me think a lot about Wells. It centers on an alien invasion that is kind of a goof on War of the Worlds, um, right down to the film being part of an omnibus series, which was what you know, that was on, on TV, but, um, but in uh, Wells' case, it was obviously on the radio. The stylizing of Anderson's film is, is obviously very different, but it's, it's got a theatrical quality, and he brings his own repertory company with him when he does things. Jason Schwartzman's been in most of his films. Tilda Swinton's been in a lot. At one point in Asteroid City, um, he has Brian Cranston narrating a TV program that is clearly modeled on The Twilight Zone. And I'm watching it. I mean, every critic talked about Rod Serling and how much Brian Cranston was doing Rod Serling, including me, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, but because Cranston is not actually Serling, I realized that I could see who Serling was doing when he was doing Twilight Zone with that deep resonant voice and the, the mannered delivery. He was pretty clearly doing Orson Welles, so I looked up Twilight Zone. And guess who was their first choice for narrator? But he asked for too much money. And then there is Christopher Nolan. And I, I could see that you were thinking of him as I was talking about these other people. Um, he's taken Wells's notion of fracturing narrative to, you know, just basically all of his films. Memento went backwards. 
um, the Dark Knight trilogy fragments not just time but images and, and uh, frame. Tenet, who knows what that was fragmenting. I mean, it was like the, just amazing. And Oppenheimer, uh, the one that's in theaters right now, um, in many senses is his Citizen Kane, a film centered on the life story of a complicated, troubling, and troubled antihero who can almost literally destroy the world and for whom we're supposed to feel deeply. And I want to play a brief click. If you haven't seen it already, you'll get a feel for what he's doing. Some of it is in black and white, like this. There ought to be a clip there. Thanks for convening on short notice. I can't believe it. Well, here we are. Catch me up. What do we know? One of our B-29s over the North Pacific has detected radiation. Do we have the filter paper? There's no doubt what this is. White House officers are down. Wishful thinking, I'm afraid. Are those the long-range detection filter papers? It's an atomic test. The Russians have a bomb. We're supposed to be years ahead of them, but... So what were you guys doing at Los Alamos? Was it security tight? I've been talking... He's wonderful. Oh, my God, he's great. Um... The, uh, I've talked about repertory companies a lot. Everyone in that, sh in that scene, every single person sitting at that table was in a previous movie by Christopher Nolan. Um, uh, uh, most of them in, in the Dark Knight trilogy, but it's, it's like they've all worked with him before. He's working with people he knows. He's doing the same kind of things. Uh, the dialogue has a 1940s-ish, noir-ish snap. Um, there's a framing device of a federal, um, a fe federal hearings the, to prevent multiple points of view, uh, and there's an unreliable narrator in Mr. Downey. Um, the story jumps around in time. The filming shifts from color to black and white. Nolan is very proud of inventing new camera tricks. Uh, in this case, he's doing it with an IMAX camera uh, with effects done almost entirely in camera, including a nuclear explosion. Um, he is forever composing visuals with lighting, and oh my god, the lighting in this movie is amazing. And his ending manages to be at once inconclusive and historical. So, I said earlier that when I wrote that obit in 1985, uh, Orson Welles seemed almost entirely absent from the big screen. Commercial Hollywood had gone in other directions, Star Wars, Jaws, that kind of thing, and it left him behind. And now as I'm speaking tonight, almost four decades later, I see, as I have said a couple of times tonight, Orson Welles everywhere I look. In the radio world that I inhabit in my job, in the theater world I love, and in cinema, where his contributions are momentous and central and utterly essential. And all I can think is, all's well that ends wells. <laughs> Thank you. So, can we take some questions? Sure. Well, we've already tried to thank Bob Mondello for that comprehensive, fascinating, enlightening. There may be a rock somewhere that has something about wells that hasn't been overturned, but I wouldn't bet on it. So, thank you again. Let's have some questions from the audience. And uh, as I said, wait for our intrepid volunteers. There you go. Thank you for the talk. I think it was very uh, informative. Um, for all the praise that Wells gets from a lot of directors and uh, writers and actors, I think there's still those that uh, sort of try to take him down a notch. I think of um, even Cohen's last uh, Macbeth, he said it was more German expressionism than it was Wells, uh, Fincher's Manka, that was, I mean, completely inaccurate, and also he blamed Wells for being egotistical, and again, just taking him down a notch. Why do you think there are those who still want to sort of get the boy genius down to uh, their level? Um, you want to talk to me about critics I don't like? <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think there is a jealousy aspect to this. Uh, the man is amazing, uh, did some amazing things. But as I say, his career gave other people ammunition to, uh, to attack him. And I, you know, you love a good story. His story has ups and downs like 
crazy, and it just makes sense. I, when they made Mank, um, you, you're gonna because you're calling it Mank, um, it's not going to be Orson Welles's finest hour, right? Uh, it makes sense to to take him down a peg in that story. Um, I think in general, um, uh, you have you have a lot of very successful directors who note Wells as an influence. I think it's almost impossible for him not to be an influence on everybody's work today because too many of the things that he did routinely... I mean, you can't watch a, a horror movie now without watching the, the film techniques he developed around angled shots and things like that. It's just not possible. And th I think in general, um, it's, it's safe to say that he's influenced everybody's work, but you know, in the same way that you rebel against your father, when you're growing up, um, it makes sense to want to rebel against the things that he did that were less great. Um, and he did a lot of them. So uh, you've got lots of ammunition. Who's up next? Back there. Thank you very much. Are you able to talk about Wells uh, as, a, as an, a young artist and how his drawing kind of informed his set design and uh, camera angles and you know, how that impacted on his legacy? Well, you know, I was there. I was looking over his... Um, no, I, he's, um, I, I know that his... Uh, they talk a lot in, in the, uh, the books I've read about him about the design work that he did, that he was forever drawing set designs. Um, and lighting, especially designs, um, that his designers then had to find ways to do. Um, so it did affect it, and his, his notions of perspective and things like that, you can tell in, in movies. The reason you would want deep focus is because you're dealing with perspective, right? And so that's a, that's a painter's notion. Um, if you're just telling a story, you want everything sort of on a, on a plane. Everything can be flat. Um, also, as a theater director, I think it, it would be easier. I, you know, the, the, the story of um, uh, when he did Julius Caesar the same time they were doing Antony and Cleopatra, uh, Tallulah Bankhead went to the opening night of Julius Caesar and came back afterwards and asked him how much, he'd, how much it had cost. And he said it had cost $6,000 to mount the show. And her reaction was, we spent that much on the breastplate I'm wearing, right? That he discovered what you could do with perspective and with lighting and with things that, that turned ordinary spaces magical. And I think that's a painter's eye. I think, I think there's no question that, that that influenced the way he did things. Um, now, do I, I, do I know any specifics? No. I'm, I'm, Worthless on that. You you need to talk to an academic, and I I think there are plenty of them who've done uh, who've done pieces and probably spoken to this group. <laughs> Other questions in the back there. Let's hear from the front. <laughs> you mentioned a uh, biography. Was it Rosebud? Uh, which ones? Uh, at the very beginning, I I talked about. Um, By who? Uh, Citizen, Citizen Wells. There's Rosebud and Citizen Wells. Um, okay. That's different than the Simon Cowell. Say it again? The Simon was a Cowell? His yeah, no, that, those aren't the ones I was talking about. Okay, you were talking about Rosebud? Right, and um, Citizen Wells. Thank you. Um, okay. And Citizen Wells is by Frank Brady and is, I, I think, the most readable uh, biography I've read in ages. It just got, it's got a lot of really wonderful anecdotes in it. I'll mention a book by Barbara Leeming, which is very interesting in part because he collaborated on it, and there are long passages that are quotations. Now, he was older at the time, and he was embellishing and maybe misremembering, but she then does the kind of follow-up research and tells you what she thinks actually happened, but his reminiscences are well worth it. So that's Barbara Lemming. I think it's simply called Wells. Mm -hmm. Next question. Pam. Thank you so much. Oh, very, thank you. Very interesting and revelatory. You mentioned that he had a guardian when he was 16. 
who let him go to Ireland. Do you know anything about his early life, his parents, where he came yeah, from? His, uh, it, it's, yes, um, and it's complicated and I, uh, I don't have it in my head right now. His mother died pretty early. His father was an alcoholic and uh, he ended up being turned over to this guardian for a long time. Um, and the guardian uh, had him in a, uh, a prep school. And, you know, they were, they were reasonably wealthy folk, so he could be allowed to travel and things like that, and was. I find it hard to imagine that at the age of 15, um, anybody would allow me to go overseas on my own, but, uh, you know, he, he was apparently very persuasive. Um, Maybe the Guardian was an alcoholic, too. The Guardian was named Bernstein, um, which is the name given to, so. Um, yeah, but that's what I know about him. I, his, his early life, I mean, you saw it in that picture. He was obviously a precocious kid, right? Uh, in the, was it Sherlock Holmes outfit or whatever he was wearing? Um, but uh, yeah, he was, uh, he, he got out and did a lot way before anybody would have normally allowed a child to do. Uh, yes, he had uh, one or two. Forgive me, I'm not, I, I don't, uh, at some point uh, in a Orson Welles biography, you get to that 350th page and you don't look back. <laughs> so. Yes, right here. Thank you. Oops, excuse me. Uh, you mentioned that um, Chimes at Midnight was scarcely seen in the United States. I'm wondering if you've seen it and what your opinion is. I and I should mention that Wells, in a late interview, said that if he were to show up at the, he was asked what his favorite film was of his own. Of his own. He said if he were to show up at the Pearly Gates requesting admission, he'd bring Chimes at Midnight. Um, I think he's, I, I have seen it many years ago. Um, it's a, uh, in terms of acting, it's his best work. Uh, he's, He's a very showy actor, and that gave him a showy part, and he was fabulous in it, and tragic. And when you, when you look at his eyes, I mean, he's, he's gone. You can see he's gone, and he's, he's living the tragedy of his own life in that, in that movie, and it's really majestic. But he's on his knees before half Right. Um, it's, it's gorgeous, uh, but it was literally not seen by very many people. It was, it was shown a lot in, in uh, Europe for a while, um, but people didn't see it here. And it, you know, I told the story about uh, uh, Charlton Heston saying, well, I, I've always wanted to see you as Falstaff, which must have been really awful for him, but it was understandable because the film just didn't get shown. So, you know. How would you rate it? I thought, it, I think it's gorgeous acting. I, I think it's, it's an impressive movie. I think I'd, I'd still take Citizen Kane with me if I were him. We have another question right here in the front row. Not a question. I just want to add, Chimes at Midnight is available here. I read it from, from uh, upstairs. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. I recommend it. Yeah. Strongly. <laughs> and I just wanted to say, I've been listening to your voice for years. It's nice to see the face behind the voice. <laughs> thank, so thank you. you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, if you, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, a wonderful talk. Thank you very much indeed. You. Um, I wonder when you are watching a movie, are you watching it just to be entertained or are you looking at you know, aspects of different uh, producers and what they've done over the years? You mentioned Orson Welles' um, influence over many, many directors and producers. So do you have to watch a movie more than once in order to sort of See oh the God, film, no, please no. Um, I, I see about 300 movies a year, um, and I don't have time to go back to see most of them a second time. Um, occasionally for a film club or something that, like that I will. Uh, when I see a movie, I'm basically watching it the way you are. I am, uh, I'm watching it for the entertainment value, for the story, for the whatever. Um, in the back of my mind, there is, ooh, that's a good scene. I can use that in my review. But that comes up on occasion, and sometimes I just forget it because I get so wrapped up in the film. 
Um, I'm usually not thinking about what else the director has done, if I can avoid it. Um, to the extent that I can be in the moment, I try to be in the moment. I think almost any critic would tell you the same thing. I, sometimes you have, to, you have to scribble something down on your pad so that you'll remember it for later. But um, by and large, you want to be there for the movie the way that the audience is going to be there. Um, the thing is that afterwards you have to describe it. Um, and so that's a little trickier. About 300 a year, yeah. I used to see 300 a year plus 100 plays when I was reviewing theater in Washington. I'm no longer doing that. Before I turn the stage back to Bob Mondello for just a couple of minutes, I want to do two things. I want you to join me in recognizing Dick Levinson, who is sitting over here. and who is the brains and the producer behind all of this. It wouldn't be possible without him working so hard so long. And let's give him another hand. That's number one. And number two, if like me, you enjoy what he has done, if you have any ideas for next year's series, let Dick know and we'll see if we can do something that brings us back together. But right now, I'm going to uh, have us hopefully end on a bang. I'm pretty sure we he will with Bob. <laughs> Murray was uh, describing at the very beginning that I did a, a second piece about Wells, in a way. Um, if the first piece, the, the obit that I did on him, was a, uh, essentially my version of the, uh, of the newsreel at the beginning of Citizen Kane, right? Um, the story of an entire life. Um, what you're going to see now is my version of F for Fake, all right? Um, about 30 years, in 2014, about 30 years, 29 years after uh, they came to me to do the uh, obit, the same producer called me and he said, I have this idea that I think you might like for All Things Considered's April Fool's joke. And I am never in my life going to have a better audience for this piece than this. So I'd like you to enjoy. A film premieres in Toronto tonight about a poor boy who rises to great power as a media mogul, only to die longing for the simple things of his childhood. If that story sounds familiar, it's because it's the plot of Citizen Kane, the 1941 movie classic that tops many lists of the greatest films ever made. The new film is a remake from an unlikely Canadian auteur. We asked critic Bob Mondello how it stacks up to the Orson Welles original. The opening shot is widescreen and color, not square and black and white, but it's otherwise identical to the opening of the original, a no trespassing sign on a chain link fence in the rain. Then the camera pulls back to reveal not a gloomy mountaintop estate, but a grimy, window-shattered New York City skyscraper, a 57-story, single-occupancy Trump Tower filled with enormously expensive kitsch by Charles Foster Kane, who is about to breathe his last into a cell phone before it slips from his hand and shatters on the marble floor. Rosebud. Kane was, as we learn in a CNN profile, the man whose international media conglomerate defined conservative orthodoxy in the 21st century. With a few terse texts to his editors, Kane could knock economies into tailspins, send nations marching into war. So why did he die without even Facebook friends? And what, wonders the producer of that CNN profile, did he mean when he whispered, Rosebud? A reporter is given two hours to find out. They got me on hold. Go there, talk to him, get me something. The original Citizen Kane was based closely enough on the life of William Randolph Hearst that its ads were banned from Hearst newspapers. I'd say you shouldn't expect to see ads for this one on Fox. The backstory it invents tracks pretty closely to the politics and personal life of Rupert Murdoch, though with plenty of liberties taken about his early years. You are the big cat destined to wander forever, spreading your sunshine. I won't be alone in marveling that the creator of this concept is actor and more recently director Keanu Reeves. My initial reaction was maybe best expressed by the man himself. 
Whoa. But that's not really fair, considering that just last year, Reeves made a perfectly respectable directing debut. His Man of Tai Chi, in retrospect, looks like a practice run, a chance to play with digital effects that in Kane he overdoes a bit. I mean, Orson Welles reinvented cinematic form. Reeves is just digitizing and repurposing shots from his own early films, including the surfing flick Point Break, so he can play the young Charlie Kane himself. You can think that's clever, and still not like Rosebud having a fin instead of blades, but credit Reeves with holding his own in a seasoned cast, John Malkovich as the miserly guardian who fuels Kane's anger at the world. You represent the idiocy of today. Charlize Theron as the untalented pop singer who bemoans her plight as his second wife. I hate this stupid place! It's a little more than that. And I know we've got all this And while I wouldn't have gone with his Bill and Ted co-star Alex Winter as Kane's eventually estranged best friend... No way. This way. Well, it's his movie, not mine. Does all this justify making a new Citizen Kane in 3D and with a martial arts subplot? Well, purists will surely argue no, but it's worth remembering that 73 years ago, cinema purists didn't take kindly to Orson Welles crashing their little party either. He came from the world of Broadway, where no one thinks twice about revisiting Hamlet. So perhaps it's best to think of this cane as a reinterpretation, not a remake. Citizen Keanu, if you will. I'm Bob Mandela. The movie is Citizen Kane 3D. The remake of the Orson Welles classic opens in Toronto tonight. Now, I want you to know, I got phone calls from critics who were upset they hadn't been invited to the screening. <laughs> um, my producers worried a lot that that was, that I had done it too well, that, that I had made the movie sound persuasive enough that people wouldn't know it was an April Fool's joke. What can I say? <laughs> I'm very proud of that piece. <laughs> very silly. Thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. I really appreciate this. Thank you, thank you, thank you.